In the dry, arid lands of northern Kenya lies an irreplaceable jewel, Lake Turkana. First time that I saw Lake Turkana, I just saw out of this hot desert, this glistening blue, literally an ocean in the desert. That lake is the largest desert lake in the world. It's this huge expanse of water, nearly 260 kilometers long, 30 kilometers wide, an average of 30 meters deep. There's a lot of water there. It's a source of drinking water. It also supports the fisheries, tourism. We also regard it as a laboratory for research. But now, the lake is in mortal danger. The Ethiopian government's been embarking on these in incredibly ambitious development schemes, quite often funded by international donors. In 2011, then Prime Minister Meles Zenawi announced a massive transformation of the Omo Valley. It was going to become this industrial powerhouse. So he proposed a cascade of dams, some of Africa's largest dams. And at the time, 200,000 hectares of sugar plantations uh, irrigated by waters from the Omo River. 90% of the water in Lake Turkana comes from the Omo River. So if the Omo River ceases to be a major source of, uh, of, of input for Lake Turkana, the potential is that Lake Turkana could dry up. Kenya will be a major customer for the hydropower generated by the latest mega dam, Gibe 3, already filling a vast reservoir. If these projects continue unchecked, scientists say that in 30 years, the lake will recede by 80 kilometers, drop by over 40 meters, and shrink to two small pools. It is often quite surprising to us how little is known about these, these issues that is going to destroy the livelihoods of 300,000 Kenyans. The Dasanach people are amongst the many at risk. Originally goat and cattle herders from Ethiopia, over centuries they have moved southwards into Kenya, propelled by drought and population explosion. Meet Mike, a Dasanach fisherman from Selisho, who supports 12 children and three wives with his catch. The Dasanach were not always so fond of fish. In fact, they once detested its strong smell and label all fishermen lower class. Frequent droughts, population growth, and land pressure mean that pastoralism is not a viable livelihood on a large scale. In 
these frontier communities, phone coverage is sparse. Internet connection is non-existent. Most people have no access to news on television or print, and literacy rates are amongst the lowest in Kenya. Ten years ago, construction began on the Gibe 3 dam without studying the environmental impact. When Ethiopia finally did an environmental and social impact assessment, it never looked at the impacts on Kenya, especially from the plantations. The manager of Ethiopia's Environmental Protection Authority said that criticism of the dam was based on ignorance. In any case, Ethiopian Electric Power Company went ahead and signed a contract with Italian company Salini Costruttori to build the dam. Activists have been lobbying against the Gibe 3 dam since 2009. Local NGO Friends of Lake Turkana even won a court case against the Kenya government's electricity transmission company Ketraco, who were ordered to make public the agreements with Ethiopia and to carry out independent environmental impact assessments. Neither of these documents have been released to date. In 2009, the African Development Bank commissioned me to carry out a hydrological study of the lake. And they were aware that actually none of the studies that had been done to date had even considered Kenya. Before the studies were completed, however, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China stepped in to fund the controversial dam. Gibi 3, it doesn't consume water. What it does is it captures the water, it stores it, and then it releases it in a controlled fashion. It became very obvious that the Gibi 3 dam would impound the water that's flowing down the river to fill its reservoir. If you take that water out of the system, the lake must fall. So my study showed that the lake would fall two meters as a consequence of just the filling of the Gibi 3 reservoir. Sasa hiyo yote mpaka ndani ya hizo mkoma wa underwater since December last year all this water has disappeared so you can see imagine how much water has been lost the Lake Turkana system is a natural hydrological system which responds to floods the fisheries breeding is triggered by floods the rains start in southern Ethiopia in mid May swelling the Omo River and flooding Lake Turkana by August. The nutrient-rich floodwaters stimulate the breeding of fish, boosting the ecology and fishing economy. During the filling period of last year, it had been planned to release an artificial flood to compensate for the lack of the natural floods that would occur. That did not happen. It wasn't released. If you remove those floods, if you stop that flow of nutrients into the lake, you will affect the ecology and the fisheries of the lake. Fish breeds in all that area. So when this area is underwater, there's a lot of fishing activities. This area becomes a bustling village, full of activities. Vehicles come, refrigerated trucks, vehicles collecting dry fish, the active fishing takes place. So we have lost all this fishing. If you look at the lake now, you see one boat there, another boat there, another boat there. That means even the fishing capacity is still low. All this was water. Fish was breeding here. And now since the water is gone, there's no fish in this area. We know from past studies and studies in other African lakes that a fall in lake level is always associated with a decline in fisheries. So there will have been impacts already. If you talk to fishermen around the lake, they will confirm to you that fisheries catches have diminished. Sasa kama ingekuwa inapata mapato samaki ya kutosha, 
hiyo samaki kama sasa hivi ile tumepata samaki mbili hiyo ni tuseme ni kama 80 80 shilingi sasa mtu anapeleka nyumbani shilingi 80 ラクラキア。俺がメジャニカ。アブワ、たら、たらちゃうふうてや。たばこんかでやかやな。かもわかるわ、こんざ。たまきりこわ、ミンキ。いいまねね、あさいじ。いめれてたし、ミンキ。わ
Well, in 1972, and because there'd been no people in the area for many, many years, the wildlife population was extraordinary. We had um, giraffe, we had gravy zebra, rhino, buffalo, and 50 years before, there had been elephant. And frankly, it's not a place I would think is worth visiting as a national park today. So the wildlife has got very few left. There is not enough grazing land in the deserts of Kenya because of the population explosion. And so anyone who's got stock likes to go to the national park because usually there's more grass because the animals don't eat it all. The reason Sibiloi is important as a national park is it could attract as, almost as many tourists as the Maasai Mara. What you can do and see there if we got the wildlife reinstated and we opened up those museum sites on human origin could be the, probably the most important Kenyan destination. You have to build hotels, to build lodges, to build roads. But nobody else in the world can offer something that could compete. But Lake Turkana's great tourism potential will never be realized if Kenya allows these waters to just drain away. The shallow areas of Lake Turkana, those are the areas that are first going to be dried up. You know, the islands would be, no longer be islands. The fossil sites will always be there. Fossil sites love dry climate. It'll only be known for the fossils, nothing else. And that, I think, is a terrible tragedy. An already marginalized people will fall deeper into poverty. Famine and conflict will increase, and hundreds of thousands of people will be displaced. If you look at the Turkana, who are in, in northern Kenya, and the Dasanat, who are one of the, the, the tribes that are immediately over the border, there's a long history of, of insecurity, of cattle raiding. Dasanat areas in Ethiopia, their grazing land is being taken for different, sort, different types of industrial plantations, and their access to the Omo River is being restricted, which means they really have nowhere else to go. So this is something that's driving the Dasanach further south. And as those Dasanach lands in Ethiopia become more developed, we would expect that there would be more Dasanach moving into Kenya and the potential for more conflict. <laughs> The region's climate will become increasingly harsher and hotter. Winds could spread potentially toxic dust from the newly exposed lake bed, poisoning people and farmland even in the counties far from the lake. Many of the impacts that we're contemplating are speculative, but we do have precedents because we've seen what's happened to the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea in the deserts of Central Asia was once the world's fourth largest lake when the rivers feeding the Aral Sea were diverted to irrigate Uzbekistan's massive cotton farms. The sea began to shrivel up, marked by deadly levels of salinity that have killed off most of the fish and the people's livelihoods. Even closer to home, Lake Chad used to be the Sahel's largest lake, but 30 years of global warming, hydropower and irrigation projects have shrunk the lake by more than 80%. The predictable result? Massive fish and livestock deaths, famine, rising conflicts and forced migration. Since March 2016, a group of young Kenyans called Save Lake Turkana Movement have tried to bring everyone who cares about Lake Turkana's future to speak with one voice. Lake Turkana is the largest desert lake in the world, and it's ours. It's Kenyan. We have an amazing heritage and we can protect it. There are 300,000 Kenyans that directly depend on Lake Turkana, and we as fellow Kenyans are the only people who can speak out to protect this lake. Just because the counties of Marsabit, Turkana, Samburu have been marginalized by the authorities does not mean that we as the Kenyan public need to marginalize them as well.
The people who are going to be affected have got to be identified. You can't just cut them off and expect them to look after themselves. There's got to be a process of evaluating the impacts, assessing what the costs are, determining whether there are mitigation measures that can effectively be implemented. And if there aren't, there has got to be a me mechanism of compensation. Experts say Lake Turkana can still be saved if the plantations are reconsidered. Alternatives to hydropower, such as geothermal, oil, wind, and solar potential is so vast, but for the people who depend on Lake Turkana, there is no alternative. Will we come together to save Lake Turkana? Or will we allow the lifeline of 300,000 Kenyans to turn from water to dust? I'm gonna need